Hi there, this is Christian, and you're watching Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. I make videos explaining basic statistical concepts, and in this new series of videos, I'll teach you how to actually use these ideas in your code. In this video, I'll teach you how to do both the one sample and two sample t-test using a single function in R. I'll assume that you're familiar with the theory behind the t-tests and know the basic features of R. But if you need a refresher, I have videos for these. Let's get started. I've opened up an R Studio window so we can start working with R code. I'll be writing my code in a script and then we'll examine the outputs in the console. The function that implements the t-test in R is the t-test function, that's t.test. To see how any function in R works, we can write the function in the console and prefix it with a question mark. Executing this command brings up the official documentation for that function. Now that you can do that, you can figure out the rest yourself. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Reading the documentation can be overwhelming even for experienced R programmers. The documentation follows a particular workflow. First, you'll see the function and all of the inputs that R expects you to give it, but R calls them arguments. Different words, same meaning. After the argument section, there may be text that explains nuances and details that users should be aware about. After this, we come to the value section, which details what the output of the t-test function will be. Finally, we'll see some related functions and possibly some examples. There may also be a section dedicated to references, but there aren't any for the t-test. One thing about the documentation is that it often assumes that the reader will already be familiar with all of the statistical theory needed to perform the test. I've personally run into problems when I'm just starting to use a new method, and I still have gaps in my knowledge. This is why I've emphasized teaching the theory first, and then the implementation. Let's have a look at the arguments for the t-test function. The first arguments for the t-test are x and y. These arguments are for the data that we supply to the test. You can see in the documentation that the y argument has a default value of null. If we only supply a single vector, which corresponds to the x argument, then the t-test function will perform a one-sample t-test. Likewise, the function will perform a two-sample t-test if we provide a vector to the y argument. The function itself calculates all the necessary values needed to perform the test, so we only need to provide the data. Next, we can specify what kind of alternative hypothesis that we'd like to use for the test using the alternate argument. This comes from Neyman and Pearson's incorporation of the alternative hypothesis into the NHST. This argument takes a string, and the default value is two-sided, which indicates that we want to use a two-sided test. The other two options are less and greater, which indicate that we want a one-sided test. Next is the mu argument. The mu argument describes what value we want to use for the null hypothesis. The default value for the mu argument is zero, so be careful when you're conducting a one-sample t-test. Zero is the most commonly used value for two-sample t-tests, so if you don't adjust it, you'll probably make some incorrect conclusions for one-sample problems. There's a special version of the t-test called a paired t-test. We can do a paired t-test when we measure two measurements from a single sample of people. The two groups that are being compared are the before and after measurements, or baseline and final measurements, whatever term makes more sense to you. It essentially converts a two-sample problem into a one-sample problem. We can indicate that we want to perform a paired t-test in the paired argument, which has a default value of false. The var equal argument takes a logical value and tells the function what we'd like to assume about the variance of the two groups. True indicates that we'd like to assume the variances are equal, and false indicates that we don't want to assume this. By default, the function assumes the two groups don't have the same variance, so keep that in mind. This assumption changes how the variance for the test statistic is calculated, and by extension, changes how the degrees of freedom for the null distribution are calculated. And this highlights the power of being able to stuff this method into a function, we don't have to worry about the specific details and calculations, we can just focus on our assumptions and actually perform the test. And finally, there's the conf level argument. Instead of specifying our maximum tolerance for a type 1 error, or the level, we specified the confidence level. Thankfully, there's a clear relationship between the level and the confidence level. The confidence level is 1 minus our desired type 1 error tolerance. 
you've probably seen this denoted as 1 minus alpha, where alpha represents our desired level. If we want a 5% level, then this corresponds to a 95% confidence interval, which happens to be the default case. For our code examples, I'll generate some synthetic data so that we can perform some t-tests on it. It may be synthetic data, but it helps me control the output of the test. I want my random number generation to be reproducible, so I'll first set a random seed. I'll generate 30 observations for one group from a standard normal distribution. And I'll generate data for a second group, also from a normal distribution, with a mean of 2 and with unit variance. To help ground the synthetic data a bit, I'll call one vector placebo and the other vector treatment. Just by looking at how the data was generated, then we should expect the t-test to reject the null hypothesis because they actually do have different population means. Now, I'll pass these two vectors into the t-test function. I've written out the argument names here, but you don't actually need to do that. For me, it's a best practice because it makes it faster for me to read and remember what I did if I need to come back to my own code. If we just run the function, then we'll see a nicely formatted output in the console, which summarizes the results of the test. In this line, we can see the test statistic, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value that comes for the test statistic. It reminds us that we're doing a two-sided test based on the true difference being not equal to zero, and gives us a confidence interval. Finally, it gives us the estimated sample means for both groups. Lots of functions in R give helpful output like this, but we might want to use some of this information in a report. Instead of just running the test and memorizing all of this information, you can actually store the output of a t-test function into a variable. Because a t-test encompasses lots of different types of information, it's stored in a list. We can inspect this variable in more detail by clicking on it. The test statistic is stored within the statistic property of the list, so we can access it with the dollar sign or bracket notation. By running this, you can access this particular aspect of the list. This was a video on how to conduct the t-test in R. R does a lot of the tedious calculation needed to perform the hypothesis test, but you must remember that the t-test function is just code. R knows nothing about the central limit theorem, the stability of the normal distribution, or how the data is distributed. It only does the calculations, and is not a substitute for the statistician. Brush up on your theory, know how it applies to your research problem, and use it wisely. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.